so much of life comes down to control. Understanding what we cannot control while simultaneously capitalizing and making the most of the things that we can. A constant awareness that's critical to our evolution. Epictetus wrote, we must be at once cautious and courageous. Courageous in what does not depend upon choice. And cautious in what does. And this idea has been shared many, many times in many ways over the centuries. Another of which um, a lot of folks have heard is the serenity prayer, right? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. But regardless uh, of how it's said and who it's said to, the point is the same. There are things we cannot control that we must find a way to stop exerting ourselves, stop exhausting our energy on. They are, as the saying goes, what they are. These obstacles are immovable. And rather than continue to push and push and push with all our strength and energy, our time is best suited learning to effectively navigate them. And then there exists those things that are in our control. I believe it was The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. He said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, if something cannot be changed, stop thinking about it, right? The future represents anxiety. It's worrying about things that haven't happened yet. The past is essentially depression. It's worrying about things that already happened. We can't do anything about the past or the future. All we have is now. And if it can be changed, then act now in bringing about a desired result. Take that first step. Create some semblance of momentum, no matter how small. But to worry about what is behind you or in front of you is actually insanity. I remember loving the simplicity and pointedness of that message. Accept it, eliminate it, or adjust yourself to it. Sometimes it helps when I think about things in metaphors, and uh, I tend to do it often. This morning I was drinking coconut water, right, of all things, and uh, I was thinking, man, it'd be nice. You know those little pieces of, of coconut that float around in there? I was like, it'd be great if they... <laughs> if they were not in there, right? So I have this idea, just grab a strainer, pour it through the strainer into the glass. I'm leaning over the counter, watching the pieces of coconut collect in the strainer, and I'm just thinking, sort of zoning out. Like, imagine if those were my problems, just being separated out of my life, just like that, how nice it would be, captured in a little net, and then, you know, discarded, thrown away. But, you know, it, it didn't take me long to realize a couple things. One, such an idea would never happen. Life will uh, always have some obstacle to place before us. That's what life does. After all, the word is predicated upon the avoidance of death. It's a struggle and a necessary one. Which leads me to the realization number two. We want hardship, you know, purpose and meaning. They're derived from our willingness to overcome adversity and transform because of it. A life without struggle is a car without wheels. And sure, you might avoid the fender benders, but you're not leaving the garage. Right? So that's a, that's a thumbs down. So I thought, okay, well, what if I slightly adjust that thinking? What if it's a subset of problems that I can remove? That's when it kind of hit me, the opportunity at hand, right? Not the so-called problems, but my thoughts about them. They are the real difference maker here. 
the negative storytelling that can be removed, pushed through the strainer. Again, not novel or groundbreaking. Like I said a few minutes ago, this idea has been around for thousands of years, but sometimes things land perfectly. Right moment, right time. And I knew what I needed to do was remove the worries and concerns pertaining to the events that I could not change. Yet I exhaust my energy dancing around and around uh, with my thoughts about them. You cannot change the future. You can change right now, which ultimately becomes the future. And there's a difference. I had to, you know, pull that back in. See, I think most of our problems are derived from anger or emotional attachment to the immovable, the unchangeable. One of my favorite sayings is, uh, you can't change the direction of the wind, but you can always adjust your sails. And see, when you remove the self-tormenting you have going on about your past, things you wish you did or didn't do, when you remove the concern that the future won't be exactly what you want it to be, which tends to be where I lean of the two, uh, you're left with one thing, the present, right? Clarity. You have officially empowered yourself because the things you allocate your energy to can be changed, can be made better or adjusted. And that's really what it's all about. You can't change the fact that someone you loved or cared about let you down. But when you dwell on it, you're now giving up the present as well. You're preventing yourself from doing what is required of you now to make your life better. You can't control the fact that uh, your company is reducing its size and your department uh, is being eliminated. You can't control the fact that 8% get accepted to whatever you're applying to. Can't control the fact that you will be criticized for doing the unpopular thing, the thing that you believe to be right. And I say these things not to be a downer. I actually don't think there's anything sad about this. To the contrary, right now that you've accepted these truths, accepted this as reality, now you can move toward what's best for you. No more dwelling on the unchangeable. No more fighting unwinnable wars. No, it's time to go put yourself in position to conquer whatever mountain is next. By straining out the things that cannot be changed, you are left only with what can. You can't change your company's personnel reduction, but you can find something else, something better out there. You can set the stage for a new journey. You can't increase the acceptance rate, but you can increase your value, go above and beyond, put yourself in position to succeed. And if you don't, they're lost. Continue learning, continue growing, continue moving forward. You can't stop the world's criticism, but you can learn to toughen up emotionally, learn to trust your intuition and decision-making, surround yourself with people you trust who lift you up. See, when you stop wasting time and energy on the wrong things, you get the right things. Like Greg McEwen says in Essentialism, it's not what we can acquire, but often what we cut away. Removing the things that weigh us down, that we're dragging along with us everywhere we go, they don't need to be there. I say to myself often that I have everything I need. It's there. Some of it's materialized. Some of it exists as a seed that I need to identify and water and nurture, but it's all right here. Which means the problem will never be that I'm incapable. It will never be that I'm not good enough. No, when I'm in the wrong, it's because I've forgotten to see it. I've either become consumed with the wrong things or lost faith in myself to do the right thing. And knowing this has been a gift. It's been tremendous. It's helped me even during the darkest moments to reacquire what matters most. Sometimes it takes hours, sometimes days, even weeks or longer, but I get there. Eventually I arrive and so can you. 
You have the ability to parse out why you feel the way you do, to categorize the thoughts in your head. Can I change it? No, okay, gone. And with all that's left begins the journey, the good stuff, the adversity and the problems that will make you who you are. And don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying it will be easy, but I'm saying it will be worth it. And that's critical to understand. Your world is there to maneuver and adjust, to reshape, but its transformation depends on a laser-like focus on that which is malleable. That's saying, do what you can where you are with what you have. It will lead you to exactly where you need to be. Even if you don't trust the road before you, trust yourself to walk down it. Today is not like any day I've lived before. And why should it be? This very second, there are roads to be explored that I've never before walked down. There are actions to take that I've never before taken and ideas to bring to life that I've never before given the respect they deserve. That saying, my golden rule, you are always one decision away from a totally different life. You are always one realization from pulling the lever, opening the door, finding the answer you've been walking by all your life. The problem is you don't see today as today. You see it as a continuation of yesterday. The same movie with the same characters and same rules. Without even realizing you need to change the script. Emerson said, write it on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. Why? Because it can be. Your job is to remember that things will continue on and on and on until we give them an end. We must manually close the book on yesterday's story and start anew because we can. We often don't realize, but we can. And that is why the morning, each new day is so precious. It's taking the mistakes and sometimes disappointments of yesterday and transforming them into today's lessons and the opportunity to begin again. A new journey seen through a new lens, walked through a new pair of shoes, a new sense of self. So here is your reminder that the words were and are, they're very different. That's why each sunrise transcribes into the sky the hopes and dreams of the you that you've always wanted to be not a crazy formula or some secret code. It's simply untying your boat from the harbor that is yesterday and moving towards tomorrow's horizon. Someday, the things that you currently don't understand will make sense. Someday, the big things you're dealing with won't seem so big anymore. Someday, the doubts you have about yourself will be revealed as false. Someday, you'll see that the things you worry about didn't matter at all. Someday you'll see that the road before you wasn't something you had to walk flawlessly, 
but rather something you had to trust and believe in. Someday you'll look in the mirror and see that you had it in you the entire time, that there was nothing you needed or should have been hoping for. Yeah, someday. Someday that will all be true. But what about some days from the past? I remember years ago thinking someday I would venture out into the world. Someday I'd speak my mind. Someday I would start my own business. I would surround myself with people who believed in what I believe. Someday I'd make a little more money, have a little more time to do what I love. Someday I'd have all that. And as I look around, I realize it looks a lot like someday. But guess what? As we grow, so do our some days. It's a chase that never ends. There's always something more. There's always something bigger and better. And the problem is not the ambition. The problem is forgetting that in so many ways, you've dreamt of being where you stand right now. You have arrived. You're not the same person that 10 years ago was throwing some days out into the universe. No, you have grown. You have learned. You have evolved. And why does this matter? It matters because without acknowledging how far you've come, you cannot acquire the strength needed to go where you must go. When you don't feel good enough, it's often because you haven't looked over your shoulder and opened your eyes. The evidence is right there. It's hiding in plain sight. There's proof that you've been there, that you've faced demons and conquered them endured your battles and overcame. You did that. And at one point not that long ago, you couldn't say that you had. You weren't yet that person, but things are different now. What you have today was once only that hopeful someday. It was a fleeting thought. It had no merit and no value, yet you brought it to life. Look what you've done. Understand how far you've come, how you ran when you could, you walked when it was possible, you crawled when you had to, and continued on to arrive at a someday that is right now. You, my friend, are a maker of things unseen, an architect of tomorrows and some days. So don't you dare, don't you ever entertain the delusion that this gift suddenly stops now. Suddenly the burden is too much. The mountain is too tall. No, what you do is overcome. That is who you are. You've done it for you. You've done it for the ones you love. And in some cases, the ones who didn't even understand, but you kept going, marching through the fires of hell to turn some days into right nows. And I get that the road before you is uncertain. There's no way to know exactly how life will unfold. But that's besides the point. A bird can't predict every gust of wind it's going to encounter. It spreads its wings, takes off and adapts because it can, because it always has, because that's what it does. I'm not advocating that you should have all the answers. No, I'm suggesting that you trust yourself to find them to move forward into the haze that surrounds you, to make sense of the seemingly illogical, bring about reality from the make-believe. Someday, 
you will have what you're aiming for. But here's to never letting a today go by without realizing that you are always living out a someday from your past. You are always arriving and leaving simultaneously. The accomplished and the student, crossing a finish line and on the starting block with another race around the corner, another chance to stretch your legs and reach for the heavens. If you ever forget that, I ask that you find it within yourself to look over your shoulder, to remember what you once asked for, and to appreciate the journey that you have undertaken. You did that. Now onward you go. You have more some days to bring to life. I was, I was thinking this morning about a conversation I had with my grandfather. In this particular example, I was living in LA at the time, my grandmother, my grandfather, they flew in from Boston. And, you know, I, I think we're doing some family stuff, but I wanted to hang out with my friends down the street, right? I wanted to go to Kyle's house, play Star Wars, whatever it was we were doing. And that felt like the world to me. Like, I didn't want to miss out on that because I felt like I'd lose it. If I wasn't there, I'd lose something. And I remember him taking me from the kitchen to the living room and being like, Eddie, you have to relax. He's like, that stuff, I promise you, will always be there. The fun, um, the escape, the metaphorical going to Kyle's house will always be there. You have to do what's right for you. And then when you need that, it's there. It was almost like all the nuance and the detail is reacquirable. And why I'm bringing this up, and it's a little bit of a pivot, but you know, I've seen throughout my life, right, personally, this sort of loss aversion, like I mentioned a few days ago, where you don't want to leave a bad situation because you fear that the very basic boxes that you've checked, you can't get them back, right? It's like you can have a job that you're not satisfied, you're unfulfilled, there's nothing great about it, you've lost your sense of self, your purpose, but you're getting a paycheck right? Or, you know, at least you have some direction in the day or, or in your life. You can say who you are. There's some identity. There's some very basic boxes. You're not happy, but the basic boxes are checked. And what you fear is if you leave in pursuit of something different, maybe you can't check those boxes again, right? Or, or you're in a relationship and it's like, it's not right. And you know in your core it's not right. But there's very basic boxes that are checked, right? You're not alone, you're with someone, um, there's some predictability in your life. Like, it'd be tough to lose those things. And so that's really the, the essence of what I wanna say, right? Having the self-belief and the self-trust because that's really what it comes down to, to understanding that if you move into the unknown, you can recreate those things. You can check those basic boxes off. But if you don't have the courage to move out of that situation, you'll be shackled uh, to a world that's not really meant for you, right? So like the job thing. And by the way, I always worry about saying this because there are people that love their jobs. I'm never ever knocking a nine to five. Like it's just my thing. Right, that was, for me, I felt so constrained and I'm just such a, like, I, I love to be creating and sort of out on the fringes. That's just like what motivates me. That's not how everyone works. So I don't want this to be interpreted as me bashing a nine to five, it's just my story. Um, but like, I, I realized that I could have walked away, come back in a year after living in like Thailand and things would have been exactly the same when I got back. 
right? I could have got a similar job. I could have found ways to check off those same boxes, right? Those foundational things, they're reacquirable, just like the relationship thing, right? It's like, if it's not right for you, there's eight billion people in the world, eight billion. You think one of those doesn't share your value system? One of those you can have fun with, hang out with, relax, enjoy yourself, improve your life? Like, of course you can. But you're worried about losing the very basics, the very basic boxes that you've checked. And it's like you, you have to have the courage and self-belief to walk away from those things. You have to believe in yourself enough to know that you can recreate a reality Right, with a similar foundation, but with the things on top of that that make you happy, make you feel alive. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm prone to do, I found a random internet quote today. It says, I am learning to love the sound of my feet walking away from things that are not meant for me. And it's that simple, right? You can never get where you're going if you're shackled to the things that, that don't move you. If you're staying in a place of discontent. Um, and the message is simple, right? Believe in yourself, trust yourself. There's nothing in your life that you can't reacquire or rebuild. But what you'll miss if you stay in that place is the opportunity, the upside, the people that will change your life, the places uh, that you've never seen, the experiences, the journeys that make life worth living. The upside is just too high. There's a quote attributed to Seneca it states, no man is more unhappy than he who never faces adversity, for he is not permitted to prove himself. Meaning, it's in pursuing the difficult thing that we obtain meaning, recognition, that we prove ourselves. But prove ourselves to whom? This is the same Seneca who famously stated that we suffer more in imagination than we do in reality. That he is most powerful who has power over himself. And that's one of the beautiful things about Stoicism. It makes us ask a very simple but often overlooked question, who's really the adversary here? Who's the opposition we're dealing with as we fight our battles? What is it that must be transformed? Is it the outside world? Or the way our eyes view the outside world? What's really holding us back? The circumstances? Or our own personal thoughts about the circumstances? And I think this is where we misunderstand the challenges before us. I want to delve into this power of perspective to explain that we are the gatekeepers between ourselves and our ideal lives. And very often we do a good job of ensuring that gate stays closed. We sabotage our own goals, our own dreams, our own happiness while simultaneously pointing the finger at a million externalities. See, when we look at the difficulties of life, and there's no doubt that life can be a very difficult thing, it's easy to look at the world as this binary playing field, right? Me versus the world. And in fact, we often visualize the world as the enemy pushing back against us as if its motives were counter to ours. But so many of these narratives, these stories, they actually say nothing about the outside world. And when we look deeper, it becomes apparent that they actually say a whole lot more about us. It's the one 
viewing that gets to decipher what the circumstance means. And so all narratives are reflections of the observer. Jim Rohn used to tell a story about two brothers who had an alcoholic father. He'd come home drunk, he'd abuse his sons. They had a terrible childhood. And as they each grew up and had families of their own, their paths kind of diverged, right? One became abusive and the other was kind and loving and caring. And when confronted, the now abusive brother stated, well, look, how can you blame me? Don't you see how I was raised? But the kind, loving and caring brother stated, of course I'm like this. I could never put my family through what I went through as a child. Same circumstances, different lenses, interpretations, which means different real world results. And the idea here is to emphasize how one of the most important abilities a human being possesses is the ability to interpret the world around him. I think of us as uh, subjects navigating a world of objects, as though the things around us don't have meaning until we place meaning upon them. That's what humans do, create narratives out of objects. And that often overlooked, seemingly insignificant ability places a lot of power in our hands. Very rarely is it what we see, it's what we think and what we do about what we see. You ever hang out with people that just tend to be happy upbeat, positive energy. I have a, a very good friend like that where his first inclination is always to find the positive. In moments where I've sort of trained myself to pause, take a second, sift through the emotion, uncover the value in a tough situation, refocus and take a strategic step forward, I look over at him and he's already arrived there, right? He's been there for three minutes, right? Eliminated the negativity, it's his first instinct. He's the metaphorical kid hopping around in puddles, whistling at the top of his lungs, while everyone else is hiding out from the rain, or at least trying to find the courage to run out onto the street with him. Then there are people who seem to always find the negative. It doesn't really matter what the situation is. Happiness is fleeting only to reveal the negativity that never seems to go away, right? The kind of person that if they won the lottery, their first thought might be, oh no, but what if I lose it all? Both examples are people projecting themselves onto the world around them. The same way that smoke covers and consumes an entire room. It's not the room that's the culprit. Here's another example from Jim Rohn, since we're on a Jim Rohn kick. He was making a similar point, and this is all from a, a collection of speeches he has on Audible, um, comparing humans to oranges, which is probably not a comparison you've made recently, but he said, there's consistency to an orange and that it can be filled with one thing. When you squeeze an orange, orange juice is coming out, period. It will never be apple juice or grapefruit juice. It will only emit what it has inside, which is orange juice. And well, here's the connection. When life pressures us, challenges us, or metaphorically squeezes us, we only emit the emotions that are contained and available, that are alive and well within us. If there is no jealousy contained in our thinking, we're not going to project jealousy out into the world. If there is no hatred within us, we will not project hatred onto others. Why is that powerful? It's powerful because again, it's one of the most important things you can do. Certainly one of the most important things I've learned to do is take that finger pointing blame at the outside world slowly turn it around and point it back at myself. 
and ask, what thoughts, what emotions, what ideas am I letting live inside my head that's altering the narrative, the story I'm telling about myself and the world that I live in? And while one might think, well, that's uncomfortable, that's unfair, a little extreme, why should I point at myself? It's not my fault. I would challenge you, at least for the sake of the next few minutes, to see such a change as empowering, as your advantage, as the bridge from where you are to where you want to be. See, if you always have feelings of, let's say, jealousy around a particular person, that feeling in your stomach like, oh, they have it all, they're ahead. They live how I want to live. They're this and that, and I kind of hate them for it. You're naively giving the external world the power. You're saying, I feel the way I do because of that out there, some cosmic injustice. You are powerless because you're neglecting your personal agency as a factor. But when you turn that finger around, and say, I only feel this way because I'm allowing myself to. Then you can ask the question so many never think to ask. Why? Why do I feel this way? Which lights a path to how can I fix it? See, the key to a better life is realizing you don't have to be in the passenger seat pointing at and blaming the driver, complaining about the road being taken. No, you can get into the driver's seat. You can take the wheel. You can take control. Inherit responsibility. And there's more at stake. There's greater vulnerability. But the upside is unfathomable. And I find myself thinking all the time, man, people are blaming the wrong things. They're shifting blame to the wrong adversaries. The real villain here is not the driver or the road or the weather. The real villain is the voice in your head pleading with you not to take the wheel. Pleading with you to ride shotgun and complain as the world passes you by. And of course, it makes sense to qualify that with the inevitability that there are some things placed upon us that are just bigger than us, that we can't control. And you can make a list however long you want to, natural disasters, decisions, and actions of others, health problems. We don't often get to choose the landscape. So as the Stoics would say, understand that. Understand what you can't control and what you can Because the beauty is that you can control how you navigate that landscape. And that is power. That is what makes the difference. See, the two brothers I mentioned a few moments earlier, same landscape. Different navigational tactics. Different view of what it all meant. One took the wheel and one did not. So that Seneca quote that states, no man is more unhappy than he who never faces adversity, for he is not permitted to prove himself. Well, it's perfectly clear as far as I'm concerned. The, the, the question is not whether or not to face adversity. I think we all understand that. What, what I hope we take from today is a better understanding of what the true adversity is. A better understanding of the fact that in front of us, there is always an answer, a key to every lock. Some people just don't think to look. They're so busy peering around every corner for external enemies and scapegoats that they don't give themselves permission to succeed. Maybe unfortunate, but it's true. You can hit the bullseye over and over again. But if it's the wrong target, it won't do much for you. You might as well have missed by 50 feet. And I think that is what we overlook. 
You can't always fix the outside world. You can't change the unchangeable, but you can always change yourself. You can always fix you. As Tolstoy said, everyone wants to change the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. You're capable of being both your greatest adversary and ally, so choose wisely. Because the world around you will do nothing more than respond accordingly to your decision. Just go. Sure, things will feel strange at first. Abstract at first, wrong at first. It's incredibly difficult to separate from the past. It's hard to detach from the deeply rooted biological whispering of, hey, at least you knew what to expect back then. But that whispering has preservation in mind, not happiness. And at some point, we need to stop preserving that which is not ideal. So go. The walls that once existed, they'll crumble. And this will be startling at first. Shocking at first, intimidating at first. It's incredibly difficult to watch foundational structures crumble around us. Especially when you know you are the one that lit the fuse. It's hard to walk away from the faint murmur stating, hey, this was your home. How dare you leave it? But those words, they have status quo in mind, not growth. And home is an idea you take with you. It's no set of parameters. Just go. The stories you told yourself, the narratives you thought were forever will prove to be nothing more than the end of an underwhelming chapter. This will feel abrupt at first unfair at first will leave you deeply unsatisfied at first. It's incredibly difficult to realize that happily ever afters aren't linear, they're cyclical. It's hard to walk away from the voices pleading with you not to turn the page, stating that because their realities will remain the same, so must yours. But those aren't the characters with whom you'll emerge victorious. Some movies must be recast, the setting reimagined, the hero reinvented. And so it should be known that your greatest strength is the little steps that you are capable of taking, the little decisions you are capable of making. Remember, safety is not safe when it keeps you from what you need. And the wrong nows have a tendency to evolve into the wrong forevers. The small concessions, well, they become the big mistakes. So if it's a sign you're hoping for, let this be it. If there's a time you're waiting for, let now be that time. 
If it's someday you are dependent upon, let today be that day. As doing nothing is in fact a decision, but only one of many. One path laid out before you, one single grain of sand, where the edge of today's world touches the shores of tomorrow's. Sometimes it's about the ability to stand up, face the horizon, and just go. Go because it's only upon going that you realize you're capable of the journey. You finally see in yourself the strength you've longed for. It's in going that you realize yesterday's situation wasn't even really the problem. It was your fear of the unknown, of leaving that situation. It was living with the devil you knew instead of potentially having to face the devil you didn't. That's what happened to your wings. They just felt safer tucked away. But it's in going that we acquire perspective. The tragedies, the devastation, the things that kept us awake at night, they really weren't that bad. But how are we to know? When you build walls around yourself, what's within them becomes your entire world. It's in going that you create yourself. And while everything you need is already beating in your chest, the great unknown before you is the water to that seed, the key to that door. What you fear is exactly what you need. And so the beautiful dance through life goes on. Not beautiful because of its elegance, it's rarely that but beautiful because of its promise, its malleability. Beautiful because we get to move without answers in order to find answers. Beautiful because what we become is directly proportional to what we're willing to endure. And that means that the universe doesn't judge. It doesn't know us by our failures or our mistakes but by our courage. Our courage to face all of these things and move forward anyway. To relentlessly explore the resilience of the human spirit. An infinite light in an otherwise finite world, a bridge that is built beneath our feet in real time. What a, a weight off of our shoulders to know this. We don't have to get it right. We just have to step out the door trusting that we will pick up enough pieces to put together something meaningful. We just have to go. And then the world, it opens up. Just like that. Leave the old, embrace the new, simple, you think to yourself. Well, yeah, of course, the best things in life are always simple, always have been, always will be. We just imagine them to be difficult. We have a, a knack for making simple decisions into complex matrices of cause and effect, pros and cons, wins and losses. We learn to think for years until we finally come to the brilliant realization that happiness, that meaning, that a life well lived comes when we think less. Ready, fire, aim. There is no perfect path, just an adjusted course, an endless series of change, of learning that falling is just a road sign indicating where we need to go next. You can't plan for that. You can't chart a course that doesn't exist. No, you leave who you were yesterday behind and you set sail. They'll ask you, where do you see yourself in five years? And you'll think, who knows? But not here. It couldn't be here. It must be somewhere evolved, where pieces of the world shaped your outlook and became the armor that you now wear. New game 
New rules, new expectations, new people, new places. And what really changed? Well, how you view yourself. It's funny how it all works. How things come together when we look over our shoulders. Like it was meant to be. As if this had to be the way things are. No, you could very easily have stayed dreaming, looking out that window, wishing you could leave, hoping for answers that didn't exist. And so the complex now feels as simple as we meant it to. We move forward not knowing, but trusting, and we look back with the sense of understanding and a confidence that was built over time. In the game of life, there are people who go and people who stay. People who build and people who don't. And I'm not saying everything will be perfect or everything will immediately snap into place. How could I? But what I am saying is that in moving forward, we pull back the curtain on the opportunity that is available to us. We move from the physical limitations of the bodies we walk around in and towards the infinite power of the mind that powers them. We become who we were always meant to be. How do we know what that is? Well, not until we look over our shoulders, of course. So go. Go make your mistakes. Go learn your lessons. Feel your moments of pain and your moments of bliss your times of doubt and your times of certainty. Because in doing so, you will have done the very thing so few people get to do with their limited time on this planet. Truly live. So go. Just go. Sometimes it's what we don't say that echoes the loudest. What we don't do that has the greatest consequences. Where we don't go that ultimately gets us lost. I remember as a teenager applying to college, I was working on the admissions essay. I was brainstorming with my grandmother, uh, talking over possible topics and approaches. And she read me this quote that's sometimes attributed to Mark Twain, uh, but that's beside the point. The quote states, 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones you did do. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. I thought this was the perfect bridge to the next chapter in my life. The latest horizon, the newest adventure. I thought it was incredible, and it was. It was exactly what I needed, and so on to that next adventure I went. But here's the thing. As life unfolded, this equation somehow transformed from exploration and dreaming and discovery into the question, well, what am I supposed to do? Somehow without my paying attention, life turned into a checklist, a question I couldn't get wrong, a test I needed to make sure I didn't fail. It's amazing how quickly we forget the infinite breadth of life because we're focusing on the dotted line before us the one we're supposed to walk. Sometimes we're so fixated on what the expectation is that we don't ask ourselves where these expectations are coming from. Who is so significant and wise that they know what's best for you 
to a greater extent than you do? See how that's an important question. And also one you can lose in your periphery as you follow that dotted line before you. When you have a destination in mind, hopes, dreams, ambitions, well, that's an adventure. When someone else has a destination in mind for you, whether this authority is imaginary or not, that's obedience. And sometimes the greatest disservice we can do to ourselves is to not stop and think, to not stop and ask ourselves where we're going and why. Do you remember when you were a child and you got into trouble, right? Sometimes you'd get sent to your room. And for me, this was agony. When it was punishment, I wanted to be anywhere but confined within those walls. I hated being sent to my room. And then finally, the door would open. My parents would say, Eddie, you can come out now. I'd go outside, play basketball for a little bit. And then oftentimes I'd find myself right back in my room, happy, you know, playing with my toys, whatever I was doing, not a care in the world. And it's like, what changed? Nothing but the context. Same me, same room, same toys, same whatever I was doing. It was, however, no longer a punishment. And I think this realization is worth exploring. We may not realize we may not even be able to articulate it, but I think we long for control over our lives. We long to walk our own path. And in this situation, the path led me right back to where I was. Sometimes though, the path leads us in the opposite direction, far away to distant worlds. The end destination is not as important as the fact that we chose it that we asked ourselves why, and that we believe in the answer and immerse ourselves in its execution. So when Mark Twain talks about the things that we don't do holding more weight in our hearts, it's because those things we tend to skip over are often the very things that breathe life into our souls. We'll go to school to get good grades, to get a nine to five, to get a promotion, to get a mortgage on a home. But the audacity to open that photography studio, the nerve to think you could rent a van and travel the country, the delusion to think you could start that routine that will get you in the physical shape you've always dreamed of. See, we're lucky and fortunate to have the things that we have. The quality of life we lead now far exceeds those that came before us. Life is convenient, incredibly convenient. But what is convenient if it comes at the expense of purpose, of meaning in life, because that's what steers the ship. A crisis of meaning ultimately mitigates everything else. There is no exploration without meaning. And without exploration, tomorrow becomes a repetition of today, not an evolution of today. And what's incredible, truly incredible, is that our purpose can be rediscovered, our paths redefined. How? By having a long conversation with, you guessed it, yourself by putting the phone in another room, by disconnecting the Wi-Fi and spending time with you. Something along the lines of, dear self, what matters to me in this world? Where am I going right now? Is where I'm going right now aligned with what matters to me in this world? And sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes no, great. But what we have now is a foundation to work off of an awareness that should be celebrated, that you created. It's so easy to walk through life and never have that conversation. It's so easy to sleepwalk to the tune of someone else's song, the beat of other people's drums. But when you open your eyes, you see the correlation between your thoughts and your actions, your actions and your reality. You realize that when you wake up, that tendency 
to ask yourself what you have to do today to reflect on your problems, those questions you assumed were normal that you never gave much thought to. Well, now you'll see you can dismantle that notion. Now you'll see that if you can ask yourself what you have to do, you can just as easily ask yourself what you want to do, what you get to do, what life is inviting you to do. If you can reflect on your problems, you are just as capable of reflecting on the opportunity at your fingertips. If you can spend time dwelling on whether you're walking the obligatory dotted line that's been laid out in front of you, you're just as capable of redrawing that line and allowing it to pull you into a new dimension. Listen again, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones you did do. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. Explore, but for you, wander down those paths that have for so long piqued your curiosity. Try things you once felt like other people were entitled to, but you'd never given yourself permission. Be that for yourself, because no one will come up to you and randomly give you that green light. Dream, because without building your castles in the air, as Thoreau calls them, you live your entire life on the ground. You'll never hit targets that you don't create. And sure, there'll be a time that only you see the destination. Great, that's life, but with each step forward as it becomes more real for you, it will make sense to others as well. Trust each step like it is in and of itself a miracle. And you'll find in time that that's exactly what each step was. And lastly, discover. Discover who you are, what you're capable of becoming. As Emerson said, to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. To forge your own path, build your own life, stay true to your own heart is courage. So sail away because you have the ability, because you are strong enough, and because the story you're about to write doesn't continue on until you turn the page on today's chapter. Many of life's failures are people who didn't realize how close they were to success when they gave up. Thomas Edison. A quote I go to when I've lost my why, when my frustration over the lack of a, a particular result overshadows everything. I don't think we realize how transformative these moments are when confronted by them we're presented two options. Give up or emerge better than we were. It's not intuitive, right? It's not normal to think, I know this is hard, but hey, I'm one adjustment away from getting it right. One move away from uncovering momentum. That's why in such moments, I rely on others to remind me, and it's why I remind you now to reiterate how small a push is required to simply get things moving, to remind you that you do want this. It does mean something to you. And you know what? These are the moments you'll look back on with the tear in your eye a smile on your face, and you'll be grateful you pushed through these moments, the darkest of nights, the lowest of lows. When we're lost, we're stuck, unsure, they are the ones that matter, so shake it off. 
See the difference? The reason so many people turn around is because they don't know the secret I'm about to tell you. The very same secret those before have passed on to me. You don't need to do anything but not stop. And if that seems too obvious or cliche, let me explain to you that it's in going that we're forced to find solutions. We're forced to become more. It's incredibly hard to stop an object in motion. But the question is, can you move forward when you don't have the answers, when you're tired, when what you've been looking for is nowhere to be found? Can you imagine at that moment what the other side will be like? Looking back on your journey, knowing that where others stopped, you hung on. Where the cost was too much for so many, you laid it all on the line. These are the decisions you have to make now. So don't listen to that voice rationalizing, begging you to take it down a notch or return to the normalcy of yesterday. Let this message resonate. Hear me. Embrace the fact that you are always one move away from recapturing momentum, from finding yourself again. It's there. Everything you need is there. Have the patience to find it. The patience to do what you do best. Find a way. I'll never forget listening to Jim Rohn. I was taking a walk in the middle of the day. I needed to get out, decompress, rethink, realign. And this message came through my headphones. He said, we must all suffer from one of two pains. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. The difference is discipline weighs ounces while regret weighs tons. And I needed that. I needed that because sometimes we forget why. In the midst of the day-to-day, -day, the trials and tribulations of life, we forget why we endure. And there's a, a strange dichotomy that exists. Because, you know, you can't measure discomfort that hasn't arrived yet. You can't identify regret that hasn't materialized. Yet, in a way, you have to. You have to somehow make that tangible. You have to know that sacrifices of today deliver you from the anguish of I wish, or if only, or maybe I could have. I've heard it said that humans' ability to delay gratification is what makes us so unique, incredible even. But that doesn't mean it comes easy. So as I walked, I became reacquainted with the trust that I had in myself, in the future, in the steps I was taking. It wasn't that I'd reached some grand finale, but that I gave myself permission to stop constantly expecting one. Worrying when things didn't go as planned. Feeling disgusted with myself when I fell short. This is, after all, part of a process. And if one stays the course, builds a foundation of discipline to guide them towards what they believe in, things will evolve. We feel uncertain because new things don't have a precedent, at least not a personal one. And that feeling of, you know, ah, I wish I knew or had some predictability, it's real, it's common. But if minimizing regret is what means the most. 
then it also means that we must have the discipline to walk steadfast into the unpredictability of tomorrow. A long-term, sustained discipline. In one of my favorite interviews, Bronnie Ware, who wrote the top five regrets of the dying, was talking about surrender and how she mentioned in her book, letting go. And I asked her, can you explain that? What's the angle? Because the way I look at life, there's always something you can do. You can always improve your situation somehow. And she basically said, it's not about what you can control, what you can do. It's about putting yourself in position to live the life you want to live and then letting go of that which you cannot control. It's about not worrying over external forces as you walk your path, because all you can do in life is walk your path. And that became the marker or the question, am I walking my path? Right, and I look at it like this. First, a vision gives you direction, purpose, keeps you excited, injects meaning into life. Second, discipline keeps you moving, becomes the tiny steps that transport you through your pursuit of meaning. And third, trust in the process. That you are here to give everything you have to give and then the rest, as Bronnie says, must be surrendered. But the reason I bring this up is because all of it fits together like a puzzle, like three pillars of a Parthenon. And when people reach out to me all the time, they're upset that they're not as disciplined as they'd like to be. And they're listening to the speeches, they're watching the videos, they're absorbing the content, trying to improve. But nothing seems to get the engine going. And I'm wondering, what is your North Star? What are you aiming for? Because as far as I'm concerned, it's impossible to be disciplined if you don't have a reason. You know, when Jim Rohn states that the pain is in ounces now, well, there's an implicit compared to what being asked, right? Compared to that top of the mountain that you'd presumably miss out on. So if the mountaintop's not defined, you're on a fool's errand. That's why I had so much trouble with my old career, for example. It's hard to be disciplined. There's no buy-in on the purpose. Using my previous metaphor, it's little steps, sure, but towards what? If you don't know, it's only practical then to look around and ask yourself, why am I taking them? Why not go drink with my friends? Why not stream this series on Netflix until 4 a.m.? Why not skip the workout? You can listen to people on YouTube scream at you to do more and be more and try harder all day, but without that piece, it will not get you very far. A vision, the discipline to pursue it, and a trust in the process. And you could say the same with someone who might have a clear vision, a dream, a perfect idea of what they want but never take action, right? The discipline never materializes. Makes the endeavor just as meaningless. The things don't change until you take that big picture, that vision, and you break it down into little things you can do every day. That's it. And isn't that amazing? The greatest, most influential people from the friends and family that inspire us, to the greatest athletes and entertainers, to our greatest thinkers, creators, world leaders, all they do is a handful of things consistently every day in the direction of 
of something that is meaningful to them. A process that has been talked about since the beginning of time. The compound effect, as Darren Hardy calls it. That breakthrough was huge for me. The realization that I don't need to leap any mountain. I just need to ascend one tiny rock at a time. And that is not a superhuman ability. That is a single decision. So here the question isn't, can you be more disciplined? Of course you can. The question is, which few things are most meaningful to you? Which will you be focusing on every day so that they expand and inject value into you and the world? And then, lastly, there is trust. Sometimes the most difficult, seeing the unseen, maintaining confidence in that which is unknown, an incredibly challenging expectation in an instantaneous world, a world where things are immediate, feedback is immediate, messages are sent across the planet instantaneously, goods and services arrive within hours, we have forgotten patience because it is disintegrating before our very eyes. We are a society of now. But the best things in life, they take time. They require that we hold up our end of the bargain and that we trust life will fall into place. Belief in a process that will come to mean more than anything that arrives in 30 seconds ever could. A vision, the discipline to pursue it, and a trust in the process. So perhaps you're overdue for your midday walk, your little excursion into the soul to ask yourself, what is it you are moving towards? Why are you doing what you're doing? Does it mean something? And if not, Perhaps some adjustment is in order. Perhaps you've lost sight of that North Star that lights up our lives and illuminates the way. Take solace in the fact that life is not as serious as we make it out to be. We don't live in a world of right and wrong, good and bad, yes and no, but a continuum, an opportunity to seek out and find the beautiful ups and the meaningful downs to set our sights on the horizons that matter. See, when the little things feel too complex or burdensome, it's because the big things are misaligned. And that is a powerful idea to grasp. It's never that life is too difficult it's that we have closed our eyes. So don't be fooled by those selling you reality as some problem, some obligation that must be dealt with. No, today is the greatest gift of your lifetime. And the same will be true every day moving forward. And to echo Jim Rohn, absolutely, it is a gift comprised of sacrifice, discomfort along the way. But that's a small price to pay for entry to the show, for the ability to embrace the mystery and embark upon the adventure. When you're pointed to the right North Star, well, the road, it feels less treacherous on your feet the hills less strenuous on your legs, what we often deem to be a lack of preparedness, ability, strength, well, might just be a lack of alignment. So adjust, because this world flexible and limitless invites you to do just that, 
It invites you to explore until you've uncovered your vision. To pursue it like nothing else matters. To sidestep the obstacles, invert the setbacks, and lastly, to find hope when there appears to be none. To set your sails, walk your path, run your race, and surrender to that which is beyond your control. And you'll find that with a vision, with discipline, with trust in the process, there is no situation or circumstance outside the scope of what's possible for you. The little E on the car dashboard reminds me that I'm pointed east. As I sit at the red light, perpendicular to Ocean Ave, staring out at the water, this is it. This is as far as I can go. There are no more streets or towns or cities. There can't be any more stops along the way, just miles and miles of ocean. And it's interesting for me to think about all the changes I've made up to now, growing up outside of Los Angeles on the opposite coast, relocating again and again, sometimes very targeted methodical moves, sometimes just for the sake of change, but always moving always going. There's a saying that wherever you go, you take yourself with you, right? You can change the scenario, the circumstances, the surroundings, but ultimately you can never outrun yourself. You are accompanying you on whatever journey awaits. And it's often not until you run out of real estate, until there's no more road or options, that you're forced to look in the mirror and acknowledge that it is you who must change. It's you who must evolve and become that person that you need you to become. And that can be a scary thing. After all, anyone can get in a car and head east. Anyone can point the compass away from the chaos of now, move away from their demons. But how many of us can find the strength to look those demons in the eye? How many of us can make ourselves bigger than what attempts to weigh us down? All of us can. But how many of us do? Are we running to something or from something? Because there is a difference, and that difference is not small. One of my favorite speakers, Jim Rohn, when referencing our journeys through life, our push to make more of ourselves, he essentially said, it's not what you get at the other end. It's who you become along the way. And I think, like everyone, I've forgotten that from time to time over the years, forgotten that value is not simply in going, but in becoming, in the courageous little steps that accumulate over time. Forgotten that the external world might inspire or excite, that change might invigorate the soul, that the road untraveled might remind me of life's beauty, but these externalities are only as valuable as you allow them to be. They're only opportunities if you decide them to be so. Change inspires, but will you let it inspire you to do that thing you know you need to do, but are terrified of doing? 
And that road, it might remind you of life's beauty. But will you let that reminder be your invitation to share your own beauty with the world? Whatever that means for you. Can you be that vulnerable? Can you take that leap in the story of your becoming? See, it is incredibly easy to look out at the world and pinpoint its flaws. All those little problems and imperfections, they tend to jump out at us. But can you identify what you, yourself, need? Can you be courageous enough to ask those questions of yourself? What matters to me? What does a meaningful life look like to me? Where am I falling short? That is a conversation that needs to be had. And it needs to be had often. Otherwise, we will drive and drive and drive until we hit water in our forced to ask that question. Because it's interesting that when we don't pause and make the changes that need to be made, life has a way of ensuring that we do. But when it's mandated by life, it tends to be a lot messier, a lot more chaotic, at least than when we make the decision ourselves. But either way, we cannot run forever. Either way, we must step into a new pair of shoes and learn to walk confidently with them into the night. There are plenty of little mantras floating around out there, little pieces of advice, and perhaps it's best for us to weigh them each individually, see what meets our needs and fits our criteria. After all, life is not one size fits all. But one of my favorite among these is to do one single thing that scares you every day. And I'll tell you why. Because when we become conditioned to turning our backs on all the uncomfortable things in life, we cripple our prospects of a better tomorrow. It's synonymous with the seed refusing water, saying no to the very thing it needs most. And what should be noted here, one of the reasons it's so dangerous is that saying no is incredibly subtle. It's not some big event or explosion. There's no fireworks show that occurs every time you walk away from what you need. No, it goes unnoticed. And again, one of the greatest challenges is quantifying that which we don't do. How do you measure that thing you walked away from? Well, unfortunately, you can't. You can't, at least until you're staring out at the Atlantic with nowhere to run, no more escaping on the agenda. You don't know until you're forced to pick the pieces up and make something of them. And I say this so that hopefully it can ignite that spark in your soul that you need most, whether you previously recognized it or not. I say this to remind you how much bigger you are than your problems, how you have the ability to transform all that exists around you when you transform yourself. There's a certain inevitability associated with how we see ourselves. And I believe this to be true at both the personal and the societal levels. Anyone can look in the mirror and see the past where they've gone wrong, how inadequate and ill-prepared they are. But the courage to look in the mirror and see strength, to both identify and understand one's shortcomings, but know that you have the power to do something about it. To know that the times you fell or didn't make the cut, they don't indicate that the endeavor was all for naught or unequivocally wrong. No, there is so much good tied into your pursuit. So much beauty and courage ingrained in your soul. But imagine, imagine a life where you no longer run from the gaps, but close them. Imagine finding it in yourself to begin that hero's journey. 
in where you used to run to protect yourself, now you take the offensive to grow yourself. Where you used to avoid the possibility of failure, now you chase the possibility of victory. You can have that if you want to. You can be that if you choose to. And sure, you may never be able to outrun yourself, but you can always adapt yourself to be that person you always needed you to be. Sometimes we just need the reminder that we are strong enough. We do have what it takes. And that the thing that hurts us most in the short term not only saves us pain in the long term, but it becomes what we live for. It is where we find our meaning. And so perhaps this ocean before me is not there to remind me of my constraints, that I have no road left, but a reminder of just how often we measure using the wrong metrics. Perhaps I needed to see again that it's not where I end up, but who I become along the way. That when the internal self steps into the shoes it's been too intimidated to wear, that when the world within becomes the beacon you need it to be, the roads and the stops along the way, they matter a little bit less than the eyes that process it all, that decide what it means, how it will be utilized in the game of life. And so, yes, the little E on the car dashboard, it says that I'm pointed east. But as I sit at this red light, perpendicular to Ocean Ave, staring out at the water, I know this is only the beginning. Everyone wants to be great. Everyone wants to be the best, the top, the 1%. Or as the saying goes, everyone wants to be a beast until it's time to do what beasts do. See, what life has revealed and continues to emphasize is that our most vital decisions they present themselves in the dark of night. The chaos of the battle, they show up amidst our discomfort. We know these moments. The ones that seek to stop us in our tracks and turn us around. They are what must be prepared for. They are the gateway to excellence. So let's look at the big picture for a minute. Life in totality because consistently doing the simple, easy things, they're important. Consistency of that which is simple is the foundation. It's what we build the structure upon, but it is far from everything. Moving right along, we have the difficult things that push us to be more, that show us who we are, that hurt, that test us, the temporary storms, they are the armor we come to wear. They're what prepares us to endure the trials and tribulations of life like a muscle that must be grown and developed. But the difficult things are far from everything. Because lastly, we have our defining moments. The moments that put it all together. 
When the sky feels like it's falling, the body feels like it's failing, the mind feels like it's dwindling. Presenting the question, will you do the hard thing when you feel like you can't do the hard thing? It's doing what's difficult when the situation around you is screaming at the top of its lungs. You've gone too far. You've separated from normalcy. You are wandering into something that can no longer be deemed predictable or safe. See, running is hard. But running when you're tired, when you didn't get a great sleep last night, you don't feel good, when you're busy, when your schedule's full, when you have things to do, when you're in the midst of your workout and your lungs are screaming for air, the cloud of pain is hovering over you as you make your way forward for no other reason than you told yourself you would. That's not hard, that's transformative. Going to the gym is hard. But going to the gym when you don't want to when you don't even feel like stepping into the car, when your mind is trying to rationalize a day off, when you're asking yourself what the point was to begin with, that's not hard, that's transformative. Growing your business is hard, but growing your business when you've experienced a monumental letdown, when you went all in and were left empty handed, when you were chewed up and spit back out, yet you showed up. Kept your eyes locked in on that win. That's not hard. That is transformative. See, these monumental moments, the ones that break so many of us, that we've all come face to face with over the course of our lives, they're not about easy versus hard. They're about doing the hard thing when it seems as though you cannot do the hard thing. The world is saying no. Your body is saying no. That chirping in your head is saying no. Can you separate yourself from that hurt and that anger and that disappointment? Can you segment the negativity knowing that you will do what you can to remedy the situation? but that life's curveballs can't stop you from moving forward for the simple reason that you won't let them. When life gets hard, you have to be harder. The one who gets bolder. You have to learn to surprise yourself. Here is what I believe to be the goal, the pinnacle. It's what I aspire to become. When life puts me through hell, to dig deep and find the emotional IQ, the awareness, to know that right now is the invitation I've been longing for, my chance to level up. See, you might be wondering what brought this concept to the forefront of my mind. And well, it was one of life's inevitable setbacks. And I had to look in the mirror and say, I'm not going to think about the technical issues that just cost me thousands of dollars and thousands of hours of my time. No, I'm going to one, learn, but put parameters in place so it never happens again. And two, find the opportunity. See, when we build back, we tend to build back stronger, clean slate, new lease on life. Where can I be better than I was? Where can I pinpoint and capitalize on the value I once walked right by? When we adopt this mentality, we become unstoppable. Someone on the outside looking in might say it's over the top, and it is. But so are the things that I want. They might say it's not that simple, correct, Running away from our problems is simple. I'm not about that life. They might say it's impossible to do all the time, to think that way every day, and perhaps so. But if we bow our heads and retreat every time life isn't perfect, we'll never attempt anything. I'm not aiming for perfection, I'm aiming for progress. Those who aim for perfection tend to spend the entirety of their lives 
doing exactly that. Aiming, planning, speculating. Wanting more for yourself means receiving more rejection from the world. It means elongated valleys of despair. It means deeper treks through the heart of the vast unknown across distant lands and through turbulent waters. It means doing the hard thing when the circumstances are what mere mortals call impossible. At some point, we must transcend the versions of ourselves we once were. We must recategorize and redefine the adversity we face in life. Be the ones who find something where others see nothing. Find value in the seemingly valueless. Let us start from the premonition that there is always a solution. And if there is always a solution, there is always a way to bring it to existence. Some will stop at easy, fine, let them. Some will stop at hard, great, to each their own. But if one dares to push further, to trudge forth into the night, they will be tasked with doing the hard thing when the circumstances are devastating. They will be asked not just to sail the ship, but to sail it through the storm, to not just build the tower, but to build as the skies open up, the wind blows and the ground shakes. That will be the difference. That has always been the difference. So what will you do when the time arises? Who will you choose to become? In his play, Measure for Measure, Shakespeare wrote in 1603 uh, a line that I think adequately sums up the reason so many of us fall short of what we are capable of becoming. He wrote, our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. Our greatest tragedies and regrets in life tend not to be our mistakes. They're not when we try and we falter. No, the vast majority of the time they arise when we do not even attempt. Because fear has prevented that very first step. It's when we have that perpetual light shined on all that can go wrong while the upside and the opportunity sits in the dark, just out of frame. And in a world where you get what you focus on, to only focus on the worst possible outcome, it's a death sentence. It's debilitating. The way I see it, there are a million ways to improve something. There are infinite roads and paths and possibilities. None are certain, but what is? Here's the interesting thing, though. The only certainty, the only thing that is for sure is that if you don't go, you will not arrive. One will never finish what they do not start. Listen to this quote from Thoreau. It's from his book, Walden, uh, which he wrote after about two years and two months of living in the woods by Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts. He wrote, I learned this, at least, by my experiment, that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dream and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. He will put some things behind, 
will pass an invisible boundary. New, universal, and more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around and within him. Or the old laws be expanded and interpreted in his favor in a more liberal sense. In other words, the world does not dictate, it reacts. It becomes what we decide it will be. And I was thinking about this recently. Uh, have you ever thought about the utility of water? Just water. And how it is obviously essential for life. Specifically, humans can't live longer than uh, about three days without it. Yet, we can also very easily drown in too much of it. The same thing that's required for life can easily take life away. It all depends on how it's being utilized. And so when I think about this, my mind goes to Shakespeare's message on our doubts making us traitors if we let them. Or Thoreau's passage about moving with conviction towards the things that matter, towards our dreams. And what I see is an intentional restructuring of the world around us. The idea that life can work for us or work against us. It can be our headwind or our tailwind. The reason we stay or the reason we leave. And who decides that? You. You decide that. I often think back to my first creative project once I, I took the entrepreneurial route years and years back. Uh, I referred to the project as quiet desperation in reference to actually another Thoreau quote, most men lead lives of quiet desperation um, because I realized around that time how easily that could become reality and decided to do something about it. For me, it was a huge step out of the routine and the cycle. I finally, finally asked myself who I was living for. Where did I lose myself? Or had I simply never bothered to find myself? And I don't know the answer to that, but I know at the time, if you asked me, you know, Eddie, what are you truly excited about? It'd probably be a lot easier for me to tell you about the things I didn't like, I was afraid of, that I was unhappy with. That's what I saw, that's what I focused on, and that's the point. Until then, I was immersed in Thoreau's dreaded common hour thinking and so used to it that I thought nothing of it. There was no next step or other side. And then I arrived at that moment, that moment I hope we all get to at some point. Realizing there's very little to lose and everything to gain. And it drives me crazy how hard we have to fight for this understanding. How much easier life would be if it was intuitive, but it's not. It's a journey, a muscle that must be built, and so we must build. We have to prove to ourselves that what's big and intimidating can be broken down. That what we visualize can materialize. That will always be true. But we, we need to make ourselves believe it. Identity is scripted, confidence is earned, not once, but every day. And we must understand the pain associated with staying far exceeds the pain associated with moving towards our dreams. The former is destructive and the latter is what we need. They are not the same. So being as we choose what we see, how about a commitment? Not a commitment to be perfect. Not a commitment to have all the answers or avoid mistakes. No, how about a commitment to allow ourselves the courage to be imperfect? A commitment to go when we don't have the answers. A commitment to see mistakes as a necessity instead of a catastrophe. In this world of subjectivity, make sure that movie 
playing in your head illuminates the opportunity, not the loss. So that when you fall, the inclination isn't to run from the bad, but to look for the good. Because I promise you, you will get what you look for. That perspective will alter your actions, which will alter how you see yourself, which will alter the trajectory of your life. Let's leave that mediocrity, that common hour thinking behind as we head for higher ground. Commonality, being average, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. It seems simpler. Sure, it seems easier. But the ones immersed in that world, they're depriving themselves of the answers they desperately need. They're refusing the hand that is perpetually reaching out. When we turn our backs on the extraordinary, it is because fear has gripped the wheel and we are now passengers along for the ride. But you have the ability to be more. You have the ability to move towards what matters to you. To take the steps one at a time, bear the discomfort one second at a time, acclimate one day at a time. This is a journey dependent entirely on you and your willingness to step out the front door to finally see the things you previously disregarded. And when your eyes open, you'll see that you can be your ally or your enemy. This can be the beginning of a new chapter or the continuation of a current one. This is your story. And by the way, that doesn't mean others wouldn't love to make it theirs, wouldn't love to tell you that life is beyond your control, wouldn't love for you to think that you are dependent on the outside world, that you need them and what they are willing to provide for you. But no, this is about you. Understanding that the first step starts with you, your decision, that your autonomy is a strength and a chance to begin again. Change the way you think and what you get changes. It's not magic, but practical evolution. When we force ourselves to see the positive, when we look for a way, we find it. That's reality changing because you decided that it should. And that's what the power of perception is. Nothing more than unlocking the gate that was previously placed before you. There's no better time than this very moment to walk through it and rewrite your story as it should be written. Here's an idea that's changed my life. As uh, has been attributed to Nelson Mandela, uh, the, the, the saying goes, everything is impossible until it's done. Right? We view impossibility as this abstract, scary uh, concept implying that something cannot happen, that it's, it's not reality, it's outside the scope of what we are capable of doing or creating. And we feel that. We feel that uh, when we're, we're in the middle of life's trials and tribulations and we feel that push-pull. You know, we feel that when we're working on something and we feel unvalidated. We feel like everything's in vain, like we're putting in time and energy. Where's life rewarding us? Where is that? you know, the, the top of the mountain, the metal, where's the applause? I cannot find it. When we feel that, you know, the, the solution seems impossible. Nothing short of impossible. And what I want to do is kind of debunk that idea and show you how that abstract notion of something that just seems too big, it seems, it just seems insurmountable how you can take that and break it down into very doable, manageable, daily uh, tasks that change your life and your relationship with the word. You know, there's, uh, I want to give you two examples 
of books that I've read and, and I've talked about them a little bit uh, on the channel before, um, but I don't think in this context of uh, how human beings have done impossible, quote unquote, impossible things and not even realized it until they stepped outside, right? Until they crossed some finish line, some abstract marker, looked back and went, oh my God. And the rest of the world went, oh my God. That's not, that's not realistic. You know, and, and what's incredible is as the impossible was being done, the steps to get there were so small and so commonplace the people carrying out the impossible acts didn't even understand, didn't know. They were just putting one foot in front of the other. And so both stories are, uh, are related to war. Uh, and, and I feel like when you take sort of the darkest elements of mankind, um, stuff that's inconceivable to a lot of us, and you, you see how uh, people were able to uh, get through those situations, it puts things into perspective, right? We're not dodging bullets here in our own world. Um, and, and, and that idea, you know, it helps ground us, right? So the first is Laura Hillenbrand's book, Unbroken. And uh, Louis Zamperini is the main character in that book. It's one of my favorite books. And he's a, a track star that uh, ultimately goes to fight in the war and his uh, plane is shot down. He goes to a Japanese internment camp and just endures hell, mental and physical torture. He's beaten, he's starved, uh, he's, he's isolated, um, just goes through a, a mental hell from camp to camp to camp, uh, day by day. Um, sometimes thinking he would die, really not knowing, malnourished, uh, watching people around him die, get beaten. Like it's it's a an environment that um, it would be hard for us to to comprehend. And one part really struck me in this story. It's when at the end of the war, uh, the prisoners are set free, and he's talking to someone about the trip and looks back and says, I'd rather die than do that again. Like I couldn't do that again. It's quote unquote impossible. And I don't think he used that word, but that's the implication, right? There's just no way. And it's like, as, as even as the reader, as you look back, you're like, there's, that is, is not something a human being can endure. It just seems like too much when you look at holistically. But what the prisoners did was take it one day at a time. One awful, horrific, grueling, unfathomable day at a time for years. And then when the point finally came, you know, they looked back and realized that what they had done was unbelievable. One day at a time. And it was just, it was heart wrenching. It was so powerful to have him look back on his own journey and say, that's impossible. Like I could never do that again. I would rather die than do that again. That's how hard it was. That's how just traumatic it was. Yet here he was standing tall. Another example is in the book, Lone Survivor. Right? Uh, Marcus Luttrell is a Navy SEAL and, you know, he's, he's in Afghanistan with three other Navy SEALs um, who are killed in action. And there's a point where he is by himself, um, bit through his tongue, he had a broken back, he's mangled. And he crawls seven miles through the mountains in Afghanistan while being shot at and taking enemy fire. And the portrayal of just slowly moving your body forward inch by inch to safety 
again, is something that is unfathomable. That's impossible. That's not something that we can comprehend. I don't even think it's something he can comprehend, right? And I'm certainly not going to speak for 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 a, a Navy SEAL, but the, the the idea is it's it's just unfathomable. But one step at a time, one movement at a time, you can create a different reality. So when you take these examples and, and you pull them back down to earth, uh, you know, Viktor Frankl has a, uh, he talks about in his book how suffering is like uh, a gas that will fill any room, right? It's like everyone's suffering uh, consumes them to some extent. And so you may not be at war, but we are all fighting our own battles. And when we are in the midst of the difficult times, it's easy to not think about uh, getting to tomorrow, but think about surviving uh, the whole war, metaphorical war, right? Not just crawling one foot but looking at the seven mile marker and thinking it's outrageous. So much of life is convincing yourself to move forward one step. And it's, it's just, it's such a trivial thing to discuss. It's, it's not sexy. It's not uh, on its face heroic or exciting. It's the mundane compounded over time. And we need to remember it most when it's hardest to understand. And I talk about it all the time, right? That Nietzsche quote, those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who could not hear the music. It is very difficult to uh, stay fixated on a result that is not there. It's one of the most challenging things about changing your life in the world around you. You know, dreaming is putting things on earth that are not yet on earth. That takes mental fortitude because each step you take, you have to remind yourself that it's for something, that it means something. When you desperately want applause, because look, it's human. You exert yourself, you exhaust enough energy. Any rational person is going to say, why the hell have the stars not aligned yet? I don't understand what I need to do. That's what's interesting. People don't talk about the fact that it makes more sense to quit than to carry on. Like to the rational brain, it makes sense that we would say no more, right? I want to deal with the world that I'm in, not one that isn't built yet. But it's why we celebrate. We celebrate those times that we move forward anyway, that we had the vision to see the unseen and do what so few people can do. That's what makes life beautiful. That's what makes human beings beautiful. You know, we see life through stories. Well, the ones that can write and craft narratives that have not been heard or watched or explored, that's magic. I talk about the evolution of insanity. I, uh, I wrote about this years ago, and it, it continues to be one of the most important things, I think, uh, th th that I've written. You know, this idea, if you take a woman who leaves her everyday life, right, for, for example, and she has this, this passion, this sense of purpose, she wants to breathe life into it. So she leaves her ordinary world and she starts building. And she becomes obsessed with this idea. And people around her, by the way, who know her as what she was and what she did, 
right? They know her uh, based on what they saw yesterday. They say, this is weird, but she's locked in and she gets up and she makes it her focus in life. And she continues forward and continues forward and nothing happens. And people point to her. They say, look at her wasting her time, right? She had it all before. This is crazy. And she continues and continues and builds and adjusts and throws her, her understandings and her knowledge and her experiences against the wall. And when they shatter, she picks them up and builds again and again and again. And people say, she's delusional. She's insane. She has lost her mind. But she hangs in. She dances without the music long enough to get there. To wherever there is, she gets there. And now the perception's different. Now it's exciting. Now she's not insane to the world around her. Now she's propped up on a pedestal. Now people want what she has. They want to understand how to build what she built. How can we make what she made? How can we do what she did? Right? They call her lucky. She says, no, for you to call me lucky is insane. What she did was build the impossible with very ordinary, very mundane steps, never losing faith and remembering, and this is the key concept, remembering that all those little trivial steps mean something. And when she steps outside, because we all get there, we will step outside and look back and reflect. We'll look back on the impossible that we built on the magic we created. The thing is, the thing we need to remember that magic is manufactured with very real, practical uh, components of life. Simple decisions. It's like the human brain is so much more than the sum of its parts, right? You can take any element Uh, you know, physically of the human brain, and it, it doesn't seem that extraordinary. We can't even explain or understand it, but you put it together and we, we have something that transcends uh, the, the, the biology and the physicality uh, that we look at under a microscope. It doesn't make sense. We haven't quite figured it out, right? All those little pieces become something meaningful. And my point is, we all have our own journey. We're all fighting our own battles. We all are going to get to a point because it's human and in a way it's required where we look around and we question ourselves and we question the process and we don't know if it's worth it. We forget why we started. We can't see the finish line because it's not there yet and we'll only see it if we continue to, to uphold that vision in our heads. That's when it's important to remember what impossible is and how it's made. And every simple decision to step forward is crafting the impossible. I had a call with someone today, very successful individual, right? Uh, very um, skilled and respected in his field, brilliant platform, great communicator, just an all around impressive human being. Right? He says, yeah, but I want to be one step further. I'm getting frustrated, right? I don't know, like, what can I do to get there? And it's like, I've been in that spot. In fact, I find myself there a lot. And I think it's incredible that you're looking out and asking what pivots can I make? What adjustments can I make? But sometimes what you don't do is more important than what you do. And what you shouldn't do is lose sight of how much you've built. What you shouldn't do is forget that one step at a time creates miracles. 
that you are well on your way to where you want to be. And yes, ask that question. Ask how can I evolve? Ask how can I level up? But never let impatience trump the big picture. Never at the expense uh, of who you are and what you've made. Because sometimes life is about just moving forward. Sometimes it's about the trivial. Sometimes it's about the mundane. That's what hurts. That's what gets you. Most people don't quit because of a traumatic experience. Most people don't quit because they took a monumental L. They quit because the little thing doesn't reveal its value. It's very hard amidst the, the, the chaos of day-to-day -day life to remember what you're building, to remember each little step is a brick that will come to uh, evolve into the impossible. Dance before the music plays. Believe in the song, believe in the melody, believe in yourself, because there will be a point where you get there. And there is a very abstract thing and it means many different things to many different people, but there will be a point when you arrive. You'll exhale, look back on what you've done and be thankful. So wherever you are, when you lose sight of your journey, think about that moment. Think about how that will feel looking back on what you've made and all those times you could have stopped and didn't, all those times you wanted to say no, but you said yes, they mean something. I'm telling you they mean something, but that is not half as important as the fact that you know it means something. You just need to remind yourself of that fact. So here's to one step more in building the impossible. What if I told you that you already know what must be done? You just need to put yourself in position to do it. You need to unlearn the rules that crippled you, the ideas that confined you. We are in constant pursuit of the thing that will magically right all our wrongs, the answer that will give us something we've never had. No, everything you need, you have now. You just need to allow it to flourish. Declutter, simplify, remove all that unnecessary stuff and walk your path. Einstein once said, everyone is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. And what's great about this is the idea that who we are is not found. It's acknowledged, it's accepted. And I think in our world, there are so many fish, as Einstein says, trying to climb trees that it creates a sense of learned helplessness. We are judging ourselves using the wrong metrics, equipped with the skills, the characteristics, and, and the abilities to win in our own arenas, but playing in someone else's. How loyal are you to your own instincts? Do you do what you know is right? Or what you feel obligated to pursue? When was the last time you listened to you? In Tim Grover's Relentless, 
he introduces a brilliant metaphor. He says, a lion doesn't have to be taught to be a lion. It just is. It hunts, runs, roams, explores, lives life the only way it knows how. Now, if you capture a lion, bring it to the zoo or put it in a cage, it will carry itself differently. It will lie down, move around lazily, sluggishly navigate its little space. To passersby, they'd never know what that lion really is. They'd never know what it looks like in its element. But despite all this, it is still, in fact, a lion. It maintains that killer instinct. His characteristics haven't disappeared. And if it were released from the cage, it would go right back to doing what lions do, being what lions are meant to be. It just has to ditch the cage. And the point is, perhaps, so do you. There's a little light in your soul that waits day and night to explode into something meaningful, where your nature meets your environment, where the I shouldn't do this, the odds are impossible, the I'm not good enough, I can't lose what I have now, where all that fades away, where it's left behind you. And you're finally free to reign over your own territory, your own life, your own empire. See, we constantly feel like our glasses are empty, like we're missing pieces, in need of something, just one more thing. That will be our answer. That's all we need. And I can say with confidence, it's not about what you need. It's about what you no longer need. It's about mitigating the noise so what matters can shine through. Removing those people in your life that drag you down or add no value. It's about getting rid of the things that make your world unnecessarily complex. Removing the need for immediate validation, success, and accolades. And instead embracing the little hinges in your life that, as W. Clement Stone said, will ultimately swing the biggest doors. We all have the lock, the key, and the map right there amidst the trivialities of our day to day. And we walk right by them, look right at them. We pick them up and put them down. But have we learned to truly see them? Everything starts with that awareness. My life did not change until I recognized that. Until I began asking myself questions I'd never asked before. Big picture questions, obvious questions. But just because it's obvious doesn't mean it's always intuitive, right? What do I want out of life? What is important to me? What's something I love doing that I can dedicate myself to? That I can commit to being great at long term? That I'm so immersed in that when the inevitable down times arrive, the losses, when the doubt and insecurity creeps in, I can keep moving forward because I'm so in love with the process but I don't let the little things like that define me. As Jordan Peterson famously puts it, choose your sacrifice. A life of meaning isn't easy, but there's nothing more fulfilling. Because when you embark upon that journey, it allows for the evolution of the self. We can become something more. As Nietzsche says, those who have a why to live can bear almost any how. We equip ourselves for anything the universe can throw at us. We position ourselves to evolve. Viktor Frankl says, man's main concern is not to gain pleasure or to avoid pain, 
but rather to see meaning in his life. To align yourself with and pursue that which is your reason for living, that's how we transcend the day-to-day -day life we've come to know. When we breathe in possibility, dance with the infinite, and of course, something of this magnitude, it consists of ups and downs. It's not the easy road, but it's the one worth taking. Our metaphorical lion doesn't succeed every time he's prowling for food, but he doesn't roll over and die. He doesn't recede or quit being a lion. He gets up tomorrow and does it again. Because it's who the lion is. And while life doesn't unfold until you find that same thing for yourself. And people say, well, I don't know. That's the problem. I have no idea. That's not the problem. That's the essence of life. That's the beauty. You're here to explore and find that for yourself. But the power is knowing you're not looking for something or someone to save you. You're looking for an environment in which you can best be you. You're looking for the right terrain to share your gift with the world. If you have what you need, then you're not looking for the product. You're looking for the delivery mechanism, the vehicle to nurture and transport your value to a world that desperately needs it. You're looking to build yourself up and in the process, amaze yourself. Look, what you're capable of is beyond comprehension. It's limitless, almost unfathomable. But it is, as Ryan Holiday says, a confidence that must be earned. So start now, earn it. Let yourself succeed. Your intuition knows what feels right and what doesn't. But the seed must first be planted. So make today about setting yourself up for success, turning off the idea that you're one piece away from completion, one minute away from starting, that you're almost ready. No, you are ready now. You have what you need now. You know what's necessary now. You just have to be your own ally. Put yourself in position to be yourself. Let your value shine. Double down on what matters to you. Look, it's not a game of acquisition. It's a game of courage. Do you have the courage to be who you are? To follow that potential, that possibility into the great unknown. Sometimes what we need most is not what we think we need most. It's not that break we've been waiting for the universe to provide or the answer we've been desperately seeking. No, sometimes we need only three words. Don't give up. Don't turn back now. And see, I know you want to. And that the meaningful thing, the right thing, requires we give all of ourselves. It, metaphorically speaking, is the most expensive, exhausting, sometimes disheartening. But this is your reminder that there will come a point when you look back on this moment and the best thing you'll have ever done will have been continuing to put one foot in front of the other, continuing forward despite the circumstances, towards that which means something to you. I remember in South Florida, a handful of years ago, I'd just moved down here and I uh, was exploring the area a little bit, looking for a place to live, and I found this kind of odd little park in between a parking lot and the beach. And I pulled over, just started walking around. 
and ended up sitting down on this bench that faced the ocean and just looked out for a while. I remember looking at the people who all seemed so happy. They all seemed fulfilled, looked like they had it all together. I looked at the ocean that was so much bigger than me, so vast, so powerful. At the non-stop stream of planes flying overhead that all seemed to have a direction, a purpose. They had their courses mapped. And I think I remember it so vividly because I'd never felt more alone than at that moment. Like deeply, painfully alone. And it's not that I enjoy bringing up these types of experiences. I bring them up because time has revealed repeatedly that from these moments of doubt and sometimes even despair come what we need most. So long as we don't run from what the world is trying to provide us. It's as though we must experience emptiness before we can become fulfilled. We need to be overcome with this sensation that there's no way out before realizing that there is always a way so long as we're willing to find it. And the pain associated with that willingness, well, it far outweighs the alternative. I often break things down into this dichotomy of the easy, meaningless way versus the hard, meaningful way. But that may be oversimplified, right? Easy compared to what? Hard compared to what? It's easy to shut down when we're at our lowest. It's easy to stop when it hurts. But easy now evolves into what's actually incredibly difficult tomorrow. A difficult, heart-wrenching, regretful forever. Admittedly, a controversial figure, but regardless, one of the most important quotes I've ever read was by Lance Armstrong in his book, It's Not About the Bike. He says, pain is temporary. It may last a minute or an hour or a day or a year, but eventually it will subside and something else will take its place. If I quit, however, it lasts forever. See, the easy thing versus the hard thing is too simplified, void of imperative context. The question is, in our darkest moments, will we stand up when it hurts so that we can walk, run, and ultimately sprint towards what matters. There's a realization that helped me because when we're in these situations, the thought goes like this. Things are wrong, things are broken. My life isn't what it should be. I need to fix this and make it whole, make it right, so I can live a good life like everyone else. Like, there's a deep loneliness associated with that misconception as though the world is put together, but I, I am not. Well, let me dispel that notion and end that narrative. The world is a series of objects that mean nothing other than the value we place upon them. Seven billion people, all fighting their own battles, all trying to make sense of things all pretending like the little fairy tale they've manufactured in their heads is the real thing or the right thing. When in actuality, we are all just passengers along on a ride we do not understand. Fighting battles that we don't often comprehend and cannot grasp. But you are not broken. You are human perfectly imperfect, equipped with the tools to take another step forward despite the chaos and the uncertainty. Steps that become, in the end, everything. I remember reading about Jefferson, how he had migraines so severe while president that he would do most of his important work in the morning because of the high probability he could literally be incapacitated from noon on. And I just thought, man, we are all fighting battles. 
We're all doing what we can to make the most of our circumstance, to redirect discomfort into opportunity and pain into progress. And what's most incredible is that we can. There's a saying that it's not supposed to be easy. That getting where you need to go requires the treacherous path associated with a hero's journey, the vast unknowns, the questions that remain unanswered for extended periods of time, the villains that seemingly inject themselves into our lives. Please understand that this is not a reflection of you, who you are and your capabilities. This is the game of life. This is today's difficulty in exchange for tomorrow's meaning. The pressure that creates the diamonds and you don't have to be sure of anything. Other than that you know, you will continue stepping forward. Because you can. Things won't always go right. But in the failures are the new tools to grow and redirect. You won't always feel on top of the world, but it's in the valleys of despair that we're forced to truly analyze, to think deeply, reapproach. And perhaps most importantly, you may have days where you let yourself down, fall short, perhaps lose sight of the courage to which you have attached your dreams, but that's okay. You are defined not by your mistakes, but by the present moment. Not some impossible expectation of perfection, but by your ability to rise and rise again. When it requires all of you to lift your head up and carry on. So go into that unknown where fear is transformed into courage and doubt to strength, go. Because if not here, where? And if not now, when? Go. All you need, you have. And when life finds you sitting down on a park bench, staring out at a world that feels too big and too complex, that seems impossible to navigate. Find it within yourself to smile. Smile because of what you've already overcome, what you've been through, who you are. Remember that you are exactly where you need to be, staring up at the meaning in life as opposed to down at your feet. Now go. No miracles here. No mountains need be jumped or oceans crossed. But if you, one, step forward, and two, believe in yourself to put the pieces together as they arrive, there is nothing you can't do or be. There is no obstacle before you that is insurmountable. Just keep going. And sure, sometimes that's all we can do. But it also happens to be true that it is your greatest superpower to simply find a way to run if you can, crawl if you must, but find a way. Because deep down in your soul, the pieces are there. And it will be, at some point, as you look back, the greatest decision you've ever made. Hold the vision, but trust the process. An idea that should act as our North Star, right, as we make our way through life, it proposes believing in a goal, but at the same time understanding that its manifestation will be unpredictable, challenging. It may not unfold the way we thought it would. 
To me, though, the most challenging aspect of personal growth, of building the things that matter, creating realities we dream of, it's the mandatory dance we must do with time. The patience that's woven into the equation, it's the empty spaces that we tend to use for manufacturing doubt and disbelief when life has given us nothing to, to react to. It's like we create monsters in our heads. And it's really an incredible thing when you think about it, right? I look uh, back on the past decade of my life and the hardest parts, and some were excruciating. They were pain derived from what I knew I hadn't yet accomplished. It was a feeling like I wasn't moving fast enough, like the winners in life had that over there and all I had was this over here. A completely nonsensical narrative, but one that certainly felt real. Discomfort from the delta or the gap between what I wanted and what I had. A feeling that would randomly dip in and out of my conscious mind uh, as I sort of chipped away at my goals day in and day out. And I started to wonder, how can I better position myself to grow, to maintain that ambition, but also to do it with less anxiety, right? As I stated a few seconds ago, hold that vision, but perhaps improve my trust and relationship with the process. My ability to immerse myself in various pursuits without dwelling on the fact that I hadn't yet arrived. Because look, I know this game. We all know this game. There's always going to be another finish line to cross. That's a great thing, but can also, when we're not looking at it correctly, be to our detriment. There are always higher numbers to achieve. Again, incredible opportunity, but with the wrong perspective. Dangerous. If you can't find a way to appreciate the now while you climb, you will be forever lost. There will always be a hole that's never filled. I think we need to be better about supporting ourselves along this journey. No one can be there for me like I can. And I think that's true for everyone. We need to be our greatest ally. So I brought this question up, as I tend to do, with a few of my friends, right, with different perspectives. They look at the world a little differently. And basically ask, you know, how can we get out of our own way? Is there a lane to both be tenacious in our pursuit of evolution, to continue doing the things that excite and challenge us, while also being a little easier on ourselves, trusting that dance we do with time as the process unfolds? And so I present this question to, to one of my friends sitting across from me at the table, and he thinks about it. He says, Eddie, well, that's what's gotten you where you are. That feeling like there's always more. It's uh, the reason for the success you've had and the success you'll have in the future. It's what will push you. It's why you will succeed. People that accomplish things are never satisfied. Jordan was never satisfied. He was never happy. And in that context, greatness and happiness are not compatible. And, you know, I, I took it in. I certainly appreciated the perspective, right? In many ways, I think he's right. Sort of reminded me of the idea behind Tim Grover's book, Relentless, that uh, it's an obsession that must take place. It doesn't leave room for much else, right? Incredibly valuable to understand. If anything, just to see, just to grasp what it means to achieve in a world of obstacles. But truthfully, I wasn't um, entirely satisfied. Right? How can we better visualize the process so that we're more powerful allies to ourselves? That's what I wanted to understand. And a short time later, I'm at the kitchen table kind of going over some analytics for uh, social media, like YouTube channel, podcast, stuff like that. Um, and my father, who happened to fly in from Boston, he's at the kitchen table with me. We're having some coffee. And I made a comment about the trajectory of the numbers. 
you know, I forget that particular week, maybe it was higher or lower than expected, I don't really remember, but um, he made this comment about the patience that I've had with the channel over the years, just an offhand remark. You know, he said, uh, the numbers are like the S&P 500, right? The stock market, there are days when it drops, there are days when it rises, but over the long haul, it's steadily pointed up and it continues to point up. And I found that so interesting. You know, I harp on the small things a lot on this channel, the little breakthroughs that uh, pave the way for larger transformation, ideas that change the way we look at things, which ultimately change the way we act, which change the results we get. And this happened to be one of them. You know, it hit me just right. What is perhaps the most important piece in the famous book, The Intelligent Investor. What is the idea that made Buffett a billionaire? It's that you invest in things you believe in and you remove the emotion, you hold the dips, right? When the stock market takes a hit and everyone's panicking and acting emotionally and selling, you don't sell, you buy more, right? When the world uh, emotionally rushes out, you rush in. And when the world emotionally rushes in, you step out. Well, in life, there will be days when your metaphorical stock drops. At least you feel like it does, right? Those YouTube numbers, perhaps numbers in the old bank account, maybe fitness goals fall flat. Maybe you're just not seeing a return on investment. But we are never defined by the events of the day, even the worst of days. They're merely a small part of a much larger pattern. And the truth is, sometimes success is so small, you can't see it. Of course, you're going to be anxious if you think every day should be comprised solely of mountaintops and finish lines, if you're always looking, comparing, contrasting. But sometimes success is 0.00001% better. Sometimes success looks like the S&P 500 taking a hit, dropping for a day, a week, or a month. Sometimes growth doesn't look like what we want growth to look like. But just like intelligent investors, you are putting your money in the belief that at a certain point down the road, the value will be higher then than it is now. And this idea has been everything to me, particularly on the days when it feels like things are going backwards over periods of time where I feel like I've been standing still, where the voice in my head is presenting all kinds of scenarios that I could have been better or done more and maybe so. But these times are nothing more than data points. They are steps along the way. And knowing this, it essentially frees me from the delusion that growth is always visible, that I can always look around and, and see visible triumph. Uh, it allows me to march towards my goals and my dreams, having a renewed relationship with each step. You know, there's a saying that we need to keep our head in the clouds and our feet on the ground. Life is a continual juggling of extremes, and I think this gets it right. Our strength is in the ability to take those steps, each one a message to the universe that we are stronger than we were yesterday. But what makes our journeys truly divine is that they aren't comprised of or built with those steps like a house of cards, where one wrong move or, or some delay will cause the whole thing to fall, to come crashing down. No, what makes the journey divine is the infinite number of paths that can bring about its materialization. There are no wrong paths. Some arrive sooner, some arrive later. Some mid-journey you know, cause us to realize that the compass wasn't even pointed in the right destination, right? They, they change what it means to arrive. But the point is, every step is required, every step is a miracle, but the power is not contained solely in one step but rather what we choose to make of all the steps combined. The dips, the lows, and the losses only have significance if we give them significance. Otherwise, 
They're just a few stops along the way to something beautiful. So why exhaust energy on data points that haven't arrived yet, on destinations in the future? Destinations that we trust ourselves to figure out anyway. Our emphasis should be on the present moment, on gratitude for the fact that we get to wake up and choose the pursuits that we've chosen. In some days, those pursuits will feel like the miracles that they are. We'll see the finish lines, the mountaintops. We'll feel triumphant. And some days, those victories will be hidden in plain view, but they are there nonetheless. As we make our way into the great unknown that is life, piecing each second, each minute, each hour together to become the path leading us where we need to be most. There has to come a time when it's now or never. Where you look at your reflection and realize that the cost of waiting is far more expensive than the cost of stepping out into the vast unknown. In every journey, that's when life effectively starts. But here's why this is so tricky what's caught me off guard so many times in my life. It's the many shapes that waiting takes. See, waiting is not always sitting there and doing nothing, not at all. Sometimes waiting is just the bare minimum. It's moving forward so slightly and so slowly that you can essentially trick yourself into thinking that you're progressing into thinking you're making it happen. When if you really stopped and looked, if you were honest with yourself, if you really took a second to review, to analyze, you'd see that you're leaving almost everything on the table. You're not creating progress, you're dancing with the idea of progress. Sometimes waiting can mean just going fast enough to not have to look at the fear you're hiding behind. That's reality, right? I think it's a very normal thing, but I also think life is too short for normalcy. I think we can do better than normal. And I believe with all my heart and soul that the world has for us the spectacular sitting there on the top shelf, waiting for those who can acquire the self-belief and the awareness to reach out and grab it. And how crazy a thought to realize that we could have been sitting next to the very thing we've needed for days, months, years, but never taught ourselves to extend our hands and reach. When I look back, the most important moments in my life were not tangible acquisition and see the flashy things that try and capture our attention, right? The money, the condos, even social media growth, business growth, whatever it is you're working towards. Right? Those things are, are wonderful. They are benchmarks that hopefully align with your North Star, but they are not the difference makers. Not at all, right? They were the byproduct of what really mattered. They weren't the moments that moved the needle. My greatest moments were mental shifts, cognitive transformation. That's why I do this for a living. I see how much can change when we step back and look at life just a little differently. It was uh, my realizing that I was demanding too little of myself. That the world won't see greatness in me until I see it in me. 
That shift that pushed me to demand more of myself, seek bigger challenges, value my work to a greater extent, charge more for my services. And that mental shift is what made some of those externalities possible. It's realizing that if you want it, more is on the table. That yesterday doesn't define you. That it's never too late to begin again. That everything you need, you have, right? These are the ideas that truly change lives. They make the difference. And if we don't become aware of these things, we leave them in the rear view. We walk right by them. In other words, the most important moments of my life were when someone or something shook me and effectively said, hey, look around you. If this is what you want, fine, enjoy, right? But for your information, there is more out there. And if you step up just a little, if you do just a little more, if you pivot and come at this thing a little bit differently, you will further that reach. You'll create another ripple effect that will transform your life. But we must stop and look around. A good friend of mine, and this is just the other day, right? We're having lunch, we're talking about marketing, and uh, you know, we always joke that uh, marketing is just a part of the business that I don't particularly enjoy, right? Necessary, but not my favorite. And we're going through kind of different strategies, uh, ideas, and uh, he presents one and I say something like, eh, you know, I, I don't need to do that. It seems a little over the top and unfiltered. He goes, man, you're hurting your reach. Like what good is that metaphorical restaurant that's not on anyone's radar? You're going to be the best pizza shop that no one knows about. And it just kind of hit me, right? It's like, man, I needed to see that differently. Maybe there's room to be a little more aggressive. Again, one example of many, and not every time is the idea or opportunity the right one or necessary one, right? But at least you stopped. At least you thought about it. At least you contrasted where you are with the potential upside of doing something differently. That is where we leave opportunity on the table. You know, we most often, myself included, paint regret as this, uh, the, the result of this blatant walking away from something, a deliberate declaration, sort of a, oh no, I'm not doing that, no way. And sure, sometimes that's the case, right? Sometimes we're cognizant of our fear and, and decline to move forward, but I wonder how often our neglect uh, or refusal is softer, more subtle. I wonder how much of our regret comes from simply not stopping and looking around, not letting in alternative points of view that challenge us and force us to level up. How much of our regret comes from simply not understanding how short life is and how quickly time passes us by. And if we don't create some abrupt change in our day to day, if we don't manufacture some momentum in our lives, even when it feels least ideal to do so, you know, the ship we needed to be on will sail away without us. So think back to your hardest days, even the ones that took you out, that brought you to your knees, and realize that you survived every single one of them. You have, for years, been acquiring the armor, piece by piece, to move into something bigger. You've been learning. You've been evolving. But today, what about sitting down with yourself and having the discussion you don't want to have but need to have? What about asking if it's time to leap where you once stepped, to run where you once walked? What about taking a good look around and asking why you're living in ways that don't serve you, 
why you're conceding so much of what matters. Again, the evolution you want and need is there. It's always there, and that's the key takeaway here. It will always exist. But the question is, will your commitment to stop, to think, and to reach for it be there? Years from now, looking back, I think we'll find that our willingness to ask those questions mattered more than we could have ever imagined. That silence often implies the lack of adversity needed to evolve. Because the reality you want, it doesn't come to you. You must go to it. And that means reapproaching today's normalcy and comfort seeing those things for what they are, a continuation of the status quo. Nothing changes until you change. So take a look around, examine those pillars holding up your worldview. Not once, but over and over again. And if one, many, or all of them must be knocked down, then so be it. The point here is that you can build. The point here is that life happens on your terms, whether you realize it or not. That doing nothing is accepting what things are. It's a head nod and a thumbs up to reality as is. So again, ask yourself what you want out of life. And if you are missing that mark, tear down what must be torn down. It might be hard now. It might hurt now. It might be uncomfortable now, but when you're eventually standing upon an existence that aligns with who you are and what you want, you'll see how necessary it all was. How it was there the whole time. And thank God you found it within yourself to reach out and take it.